Welcome everyone to today's Synergis webinar, The New IH for the Next Normal. I'm Kay Bechtold, Managing Editor of the Synergist, the magazine of AIHA. I'd like to thank all of our attendees and especially SGS Galton for sponsoring today's webinar. Our speaker today, our speaker today is Ron McMahon, who leads the Marketing and Business Development Team at SGS EHS USA as Director of Business and Solution Development. He works with staff and clients to develop innovative ways to make sampling simpler. Trained as an industrial engineer, Ron has spent his career in management, marketing, business strategy, and innovation development roles for environmental, transportation, and safety products and services concerns. This includes leading development teams for numerous unmanned system controllers and instrumentation design applications and training involving measuring health and safety-oriented air parameters and regulatory requirements. And now I'll turn the presentation over to Ron. Uh, good day, everyone. I hope everybody's uh, staying safe and doing well. Um, so uh, today's presentation is really a presentation to get everyone thinking about how, uh, as technology goes forward, how we innovate. And due to the pandemic, there's been some developments that have come to light and, and uh, have been produced that um, really make it make it very interesting to how we can move things forward. And so this presentation today is to get everyone thinking and to get everyone collaborating and, and innovating um, as we move forward uh, as uh, in the IH world. And for us, at uh, SGS Golson Labs, it's unique because we rent instruments, we provide uh, instruments that are web enabled, uh, we do lab analysis. So for SGS Golson, we understand the principles of uh, exactness, you know, specificity, all those kind of things. And so the, the key to this presentation is sort of looking at the future, look at what's going on around us and how some of the new technology that's really been driven by the pandemic can, can maybe think about how we uh, look at our own uh, implementation of IH uh, around the world. Um, so that will be the topic today, and I really appreciate AIH and everyone being on the call, and I hope you enjoy this. And for sure, lots of questions because uh, there will there'll be some uh, data in this. I'm sure that people will find uh, questionable that they want to talk about, uh, but uh, also any time after this presentation, if you want to reach out to me uh, on our trial programs or anything that we do or any technical questions you've got, um, I want to collaborate. I want to work with people to innovate, and we're an open book to, uh, to help in any way we can. So please, please don't hesitate. So again, welcome everyone, and, and we'll get started. By the way, I sound pretty good when I get introduced like that. Uh, I like that. Sometimes I don't even know who they're talking about. Um, so uh, some of you I've spoken to about this topic. We've been talking about, um, you know, IoT and different things, different technologies, cloud-based computing for IH for some time. And some of you I've had the privilege of sitting in with. So um, hopefully this is something we'll just keep expanding on our conversations and, and uh, keep going down the path of innovation around this uh, particular topic. So um, today our, our goal is really to really uh, everybody to begin to understand, uh, and probably some of you already have a handle on it or are beginning to see the power of what's been called the IoT or the Internet of Things. And what's really important from this talk, I think from a purpose of innovation, is how the, the sensor world and the Internet of Things and cloud computing are coming together that really could change how we do day-to-day -day industrial hygiene work. And it just so happens the pandemic brought something to the forefront that uh, I think is interesting and I think you'll find interesting and hopefully you've heard about some of these things with contact tracing that uh, will help you be enlightened and, and maybe, again, give you the information you need uh, to innovate on your own. Uh, and that's really the key. Uh, nobody, no one that's not in the field and not dealing with day-to-day issues and, and real reality of data and things, uh, it, the people that aren't doing it, really it's hard to imagine what you could do to improve it. So it's really based on everybody probably on this call that has been in the field that understands data and what they have to do with it. And it has to be defensible that you're really, you're the ones that will innovate. All, all I'm trying to do through this conversation is, is to open up some eyes and, and help educate on a couple of things that we see coming. We know it's coming, uh, even while waiting for this talk, you saw the next uh, the next webinar is about IoT and, and industrial scientific. So it, this is this is something that's moving quickly and, and uh, that's getting to the point of affordability. So it's going to be really interesting. 
so we'll uh, we'll just start going this thing, and uh, hopefully we can uh, build some core basics and some information. That everybody can start to um, really think about how they can improve and and innovate on their own on their own uh, in their own jobs and their own functions. So the first thing again, and uh, anyone that's sat through my talks in the past, uh, Internet of Things. Uh, you know, at one point I had one of our senior people in our company, a $10 billion company, tell me never to say IOT again. And I looked at him and I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure why you're saying that, but because it is, it is where, where we're all going. Um, and so what is the Internet of Things? Basically what it does is it encompasses every item that connects to the cloud uh, to bring things together. Um, and heavily IOT is thought of as, as sensor-generated data or field uh tablet inner data and those kind of things. So so when we talk about the Internet of Things, it's really the whole concept of things moving toward automation and simplifying how we uh, gather lots of data and how we can portray that data. Um, and so the Internet of Things becomes everything that's interconnected through the cloud. And so the, it, when you think about the cloud, today this call is basically a cloud-based conversation. We're all on the cloud. We're, we're all connecting to the cloud. and. The cloud is, is basically a network of servers that it all have a unique function, um, but they're not a single physical entity. In, in the days gone by when we used to do different programs or different automation systems, uh, it would reside on a local computer, it would be in our server room, it would be on our desktop, and it would all be right there with us. And, and with the advent of fast Internet, basically the connection to Internet, and with cloud computing and the interactivity between these servers, uh, we now have uh, speeds that almost, for some of you that go back to the 80s when computers really first came out in the early 90s, uh, that rival any speed we ever had on a local device. So that ability now to, to be able to connect to the cloud, through the Internet, through your phone, through any device, uh, and get to data is changing how we look at data. We don't, we don't need to necessarily have it on our computer any longer. Um, you know, at SGS, we use Teams. And even within Teams, we share documents and we do real-time adjustments to a spreadsheet or to a plan while everybody's online looking at it. And that collaborative effort is, is the power of the cloud. And, and now we're moving toward, you know, being able to do more and more with that data if we can get it to the cloud. And the key has always been affordability, just like cell phones. Uh, you know, again, I had, uh, I've gone through the whole thing, right, from bag phones to flip phones to on and on and on, and, and now, look, everyone has a phone. And that's all due because of availability and affordability, and volume drives these things. And so in our world, we're seeing these volume-driven items finally coming to really the IH circle, and, and now we can start utilizing that for our own capability. So cloud computing, that's the practice of basically being able to get data into a server and, instead of a personal computer, and once it's on that server, every single piece of data, every every cell, just like the cell um, uh, in your you know in, in your spreadsheet, has an address, and that means that anywhere that anybody can get access to that cell, that one piece of data, uh, can do whatever they want to do with it effectively if they have the authorization to do that. So um, that interactivity or that inner uh, ability to pull data from public sites, from our own sites, from from lab data, from whatever, is all come together. It's all come together in the cloud and, and different pieces of software, whether they're customized or they're a standard off-the-shelf app you can pay 20 bucks a month for or whatever, uh, we now have the ability to take those pieces of data that we have access to and basically meld it into whatever we want, whether it's a hard report, a dashboard, uh, any of those things, it's it's all available to us now. So um, the key to sensors, uh, and especially important to this discussion, is sensors are getting less expensive. Sensors are getting more accurate. The ability to connect higher level sensors or more accurate sensors to the cloud is like no longer even an issue. Uh, back in the day, you'd have to have a 450 megahertz radio, you know, whatever, satellite beam, blah, blah, blah. Now it's a matter of can you get Wi-Fi or do you have, uh, are you in an area that has decent cellular connectivity? And with that being said, now that ability to connect data to the cloud 
sensor data, uh, it's just readily available. There's, there's no longer any unique science or anything crazy about it. It's just there. And we just, all we have to do is plug and play the pieces. Um, so that readable capability to get data to the cloud that we can look at, that we can share, that we can uh, manipulate uh, for the purpose of, uh, you know, combining it with algorithms or, or, or doing things with it that turn it into data we really want to use because we all don't want to look at all the data. Uh, the one thing we all know now, especially with the advent of smart sense for us, is you don't want to look at the data. You just want reports that give you the information you need from that data, and you want to be notified maybe if there's something that's uh, not uh, within a range that you find acceptable for whatever the application is. So those algorithms now can be plugged in using that data, uh, including artificial intelligence. That's a you know that's a word that people use. Uh, automatic learning. Um, and, you know, in a lot of what we do, maybe that's not as big, but it could be. Uh, but right now, I think all of us would be more comfortable with the term algorithms. How do we bring in these data points and run algorithms based on that data? So this is an example. This is an, it happens to be an SDS product. It's called LiveView. Uh, this, this dashboard that we're looking at right now, as an example, brings in air quality data from every publicly reported uh, air monitor, in this case, North America, but it, it can be the world. We, we also, this thing expands all the way out. Uh, it also pulls in wildfire data, so you're seeing a bunch of little dots that represent wildfire from a public data source. And then there's also, in this, um, our own sensors. And in this case, we only have a couple, uh, and it's a very faint little black dot over in California, but that's coming from a smart sense unit. Uh, and you also see the depiction of wind, uh, what's the airflow doing? And so all of these things now, this is a great example of how we've taken public data, melded it with real-time data, and have put it into one dashboard that very quickly you can get a feel for what's going on and get information that can help you make decisions. Like, for example, in the case of the wildfires uh, in California, Oregon, Washington, uh, everywhere, <laughs> what, what, no, do we need to worry about that? What's the particle measurements? Um, and now these things come together for us to help make better decisions uh, in a simple view, simple way of combining this data in one place. And this is just an example of it. The other thing that obviously is, is driving a lot of this is the cost of sensors. So sensor cost and the ability to develop instrumentation that will get sensor data to the cloud has, has been dropped dramatically. Um, uh, at one point, I was one of the drivers of one of the largest gas detection companies in the world. And in 1998, we connected sensors to the cloud using um, some RIM modems. And it was it was so unique, so interesting. We connected to the Internet and you know, all these things. We showed real-time data. Uh, and it was such an engineering feat to get that done. And today, it's just it's there. It's just everything is available. Even companies like Industrial Scientific, other companies, uh, you know, are releasing products that connect to the cloud. And um, so it's just getting affordable to do. Obviously, if you have Wi-Fi, you connect. Uh, if you have a cellular uh, network, you can connect. Uh, now there's new systems, LoRa, and other things that are coming out that are going to make these things so affordable to connect to the cloud. It just almost doesn't make sense anymore to do anything really different. It, it's just so simple. Um, and you can retrieve the data anywhere in the world, any moment of the day, get notifications and all those things. So, so all this sensor data, connectivity, all these things are moving us down this path. Um, and we will get to where this ties into what's happened with the pandemic and what came out of that and how, how we're going to combine some of this technology with pandemic-related technology. And, again, it's not just strictly pandemic, but it's been pointed toward that uh, for contact tracing. So this is a perfect example. Here's a, a platform, very simple, that for $65 I can get, you know, uh, just almost anything I want. So six devices with six sensors, $135 a unit. I mean, that, that's incredible to even think about that. Now, some of the sensors you might choose may not be accurate enough for your application, but then again, it may be. And those are the things that that's really unique about SGS Galson is we have the ability to look at, Accuracy, what are the claims? Are the claims accurate? Um, and do you really need a high level sensor to do what you're doing? Could you get away with something less expensive? Uh, and maybe even, you know, deploy it continuously, uh, just depending on the application or, or the criticalness of the application. So all of these things are, are, are evolving, and uh, this is just one example. I mean, the cost 
or the connectivity, some of the cellular data, data fees now for these low frequency bursts of data to the cloud could be as low as, low as $3 a month. And what's the advantage to that is we don't have to connect anything. We don't have to worry about our Wi-Fi network. We don't have to worry about bypassing, you know, the firewalls or all those things. I can get the data to, to my cloud device that, that I can look at the data now remotely, and that, it costs me $3 a month. Um, it just isn't, you know, it just isn't a lot. And even in the case of today with, with SmartSense, uh, we're at $13 a month, and that's about to drive to $7 a month. So, again, it, it's just getting so, in, in, you know, just inexpensive to do. So once you have all this data in the cloud, you know, one of the most simple things that we provide and that people are providing, you know, everywhere in these applications are simple graphs. That ability to see a trend over time of a certain uh, uh, sensor is incredible. Uh, all the sensors in the smart sensor are exactly the same sensors that an industrial scientific or somebody like that would, would use. We use sensors from all manufacturers. Uh, AlphaSense is the company that provides our sensors. We can use CityTech. We can use, it doesn't matter, uh, Ion Science. That's our PID. So once you get this reliable data to the cloud, or maybe less reliable as far as accuracy, but you understand that, now the data comes in and you're able to, to do things very quickly and just look at instant data and make some good decisions and be able to see where the peaks occurred and what was going on at that time of day. Do, you know, what can we do to fix that? What can we do to alter the process to make it better? And then came the pandemic, and everybody's familiar with the term contact tracing. Contact tracing got to be a very, very, very big thing, and, and, and we understand that, that we need to be able to track things down, notify people uh, to assist in preventing the spread of this disease. And so contact tracing for us took on an, another meaning in the sense that uh, we were looking at it for the purpose of companies. So. From a company perspective, in a pandemic, how can we get businesses open? How can we help contact tracing, um, you know, in the workplace? And how can we notify people again very quickly or, or get the information we need to make decisions regarding someone that potentially has been exposed to a carrier, uh, asymptomatic, or, or whatever? So all of a sudden, contact tracing became a big uh, part of what we were looking at doing, along with some of our other technology offerings. But contact tracing was one that kind of caught my interest. And again, this is this is something to get everyone thinking. This is that we do have a contact tracing solution we're going to release. We have two of them. But the reality is, and there's a lot of contact tracing solutions out there now, uh, not only on phones and such that track everywhere, but also just things that you can wear, little badges and things that can help you in in the workplace. So, but the key is 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 this all ties into where people are located. And again. This talk and this discussion is to get people thinking, to collaborate with each other, to is this something that could help us um, make a new normal? Is it something that could change how we look at how we do our business today uh, based on uh, the fundamentals of contact tracing? So, again, contact tracing, uh, you know, uh, today you go to a restaurant, you go to different places, people uh, go and they, you know, they, you have to give them your name, your phone number. And, different things like that. In the case of a, a building, uh, it takes on a little bit different meaning in the fact that we know there's privacy issues. We know there's things that that's why a lot of people don't want the apps on their phones or different items. So a lot of people develop contact tracing that could be used in the workplace itself. Once outside of the workplace, uh, there was nothing, uh, there was no connectivity. There was no way to see where a person was outside of the work zones. Uh, and you could eliminate areas within a building that you don't even want to know where they are, like privacy areas that shouldn't be known, if you will. So contact tracing is a burgeoning thing. There's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of people that come with this technology. Going along with the whole cloud IoT computing capability, cloud computing capability, the sensors that are used for this have become so inexpensive. It's, it's ab absolutely mind-boggling. Uh, back in the uh, early 2000s, I was – kind of headed up a, uh, if you will, a ground robotic team that we provided control systems to the uh, Department of Defense for controlling ground robots for EOD uh, applications. And in that, we worked with a company that had this tracing technology. This company made this cool ultra-wideband system that could tell you where, you know, what was going on. There were some of the original writers of, of the data protection to make sure things wouldn't collide and, and all those type of things that we have today now in cars and, and such. Um, but back then, that technology would cost thousands of dollars. We're now talking about contact tracing systems that the actual physical cost to do, say, 10,000 square feet 
and 100 people is below $3,000. I mean, it's just mind-boggling the cost difference. And it's all because of those innovations to get data to the cloud. It's all because of IoT and because of the, the amplification and magnitude of the, of the volume of these devices. So here's an example of, of an IoT system uh, that is contact tracing. So basically, in this network of devices, and this all leads to where we're going for the next IH, but I, I want you to understand the components um, and, and uh, it, it, you may be interested in these components and other, other systems that could help you in this way with regards to even dealing with COVID. But basically what it is is by placing what's called anchors throughout a facility and then putting on what we call asset tags or sensor nodes. And this technology was used a lot for tracking assets in warehouses uh, and other areas, uh, big, uh, you know, shipping yards, freight yards. Um, and, and now it's come down to uh, the affordability to be able to put it anywhere. And so this technology has let, let itself. So the gateway will take all the data that comes from all these devices, including the badges and the anchors, and send that data to the cloud. And what the anchor is doing is it's continuously pinging everyone's badge so or, or the device. And as it pings that device, it's, it's doing it. Uh, there's multiple anchors doing that. So basically, just think of it almost in some cases as triangulation. Uh, in other cases, you could have an anchor, and it's just a matter of who's close to that anchor. So, for example, in the case of contact tracing, you could just have a facility, and in all your meeting rooms, you have an anchor, and everyone's wearing badges, and you could very simply tell if there was one person, five people, ten people in a room, uh, instantaneously, again, using a cloud portal, getting the data through the gateway, uh, so that it's more of like a zone approach. Then there's contact tracing that you actually can tell where somebody is within three feet. If anybody uh, has ever watched Harry Potter, which probably a lot of you have, uh, Marauder's Map, where they would open the map and they could see the dinosaur moving through the castle and all those things. Well, that, that technology now is real and it's affordable. And again, do we want to apply that security, you know, things, people's own private, you know, uh, privacy, it, all those things come into question. But uh, you know, we have security cameras everywhere, and those things have gone through the same kind of rigorous viewpoint, and, and yet it's still, they exist in our workplace. So I don't think we're too far away from having some of these type of things accepted by uh, work staff, especially when it comes to it's, it's for the protection of the worker. It's not a matter of tracking the worker. It's a matter of making sure that if someone is exposed, in this case, to COVID, we're able to respond effectively and take care of it uh, and try and isolate everyone that it could have been exposed. So the components are very simple. They look like this. Uh, even a smart sense at this point, we, we don't haven't finished the development, but it can act as a node. Uh, but there are nodes av available uh, that look like that that are all sensor based. Uh, the anchors uh, again are the things that you you fix permanently in the building, and you know where they are on a floor plan. So those get mapped accordingly. And then you have your personal asset tracking tag, which is really nothing more than just a regular badge. It's a thin little badge that, uh, you know, you wear on a clip, uh, just like any other worker's badge, really. Um, and those are the, the main devices. The gateway, then, is our key to be able to get the data to the cloud, because without the cloud, there's so much calculations, so many calculations, so many things going on. Uh, to crunch this data and crunch it effectively, uh, it, it's not easy. So the power of some of the servers and the devices that are on the cloud give us that capability, give us the ability to calculate these things out and uh, be able to know exactly what's going on at any moment. And then the, uh, this is an example of an office uh, showing some people, showing some anchors, uh, showing some nodes. And again, it's probably a little bit hard to see, but it basically is representing what it would look like uh, that you could see on a dashboard if you were doing continuous monitoring of these kinds of things. Again, these devices and the cloud can do alerting. Hey, you got five people. You only wanted four in this area. Now there's five. Um, and you can change the proximity on, on the, on the simple devices. And then obviously the ones that are giving us real time and give us that data, uh, is, uh, is a little different situation. And you can be much more exact with the placement of the individual throughout the facility or wherever you want to be able to detect within the facility. And this is the architecture of what's really unique today. If you, if anybody understands the term mesh network, before everything had to touch, it had to be able to reach and touch basically gateway. They had to be able to get to the device that would take it out to the cloud or to the internet. And now with what's called mesh network capability, these low power 
low energy devices uh, have the ability to transmit between themselves to get everything back to what's providing the data to the cloud. So the, all these joint technologies, all these things coming together again in the world of IoT has gotten us to this point. So what does that mean to us now uh, in the industrial hygiene world? Uh, what, does that, what does that turn into? Well, uh, it turns into the reality is uh, if, we're doing, if we're contact tracing, uh, maybe not just for the purpose of COVID, but maybe for a new way of doing IH monitoring, um, we're, we're looking at where, where is the worker? Where is the worker? Where, where are the locations that if this worker, not just for COVID, but where is this worker in relation to any hazard that we could monitor continuously? Where, where, is, where are they in relation to uh, sound, uh, to a chemical potential release, to, you know, a really cool example, and I'll throw this out, and a lot of gas detection people will go, oh, is you don't need to wear a badge anymore. You don't need an H2S badge on every individual. You just need to put sensors around the area that has H2S. And as that person gets closer and you're monitoring the real concentration of H2S continuously with really good monitors, then you just alert the person that they're, they're getting to a location and they're beginning to enter an area that could be hazardous, as opposed to having everybody wear one and having 5,000 of these badges everywhere. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to put gas detection people out of, out of business. It's just, it's a way of thinking of how we're gonna move forward. If you think about SDS, Galson doing a thing like this and showing sensors, you think, oh my gosh, well, why would you be talking about this? It's going to kill your sensor business. And SGS as a whole, a $10 billion entity, we realize that due to the majority of our business comes from lab analysis. We realize that if we don't get in the front end of sensors and monitoring and exact data and you know automated calibration and sample collection and all these things that can benefit us, uh, one day we're going to wake up and it'll be like uh, you know like uh, you know regular film in a camera. I don't know if anybody has a camera anymore that's got film in it, but you can imagine, you know, that boardroom of people going, oh, we can't, we can't come out with this digital photography thing. It'll ruin our film business. And, and one of the cool things about SCS being a progressive company that's really interested in advancing to the future and, and with partners like all of you, uh, it's, it's this kind of thing is what can we do to make it better? How can we make the world better? And, and the cool thing about SCS is they're willing to invest in it. So it's, it's a fun place. For, for anyone to be that's trying to look toward the future. So that's the reason SDS is involved in this. And it's the same thing with, with gas detection companies and different companies. You'll, you'll start to see the melding of all these technologies coming together or a way to interact so that we all can share data and, and make it better for our users and, and uh, for the protection of work or data for the protection of workers. So anyway, this, 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 all these things are really interesting, you know, the, uh, as we go forward. Um, there's just installation is almost nothing to put in like a contact tracing system. Uh, power requirements are almost nothing. Uh, the uh, ability to get it to the cloud is simple. If you don't have an ability to get a gateway to the cloud, the gateway can have a cellular modem. Uh, and it can scale up. Once, once you start to build a network in, it just becomes very easy, very simple to make not only the cost to get it, but the cost to install it and maintain it, it gets very attractive. So all of that just to get to the new IH for the next normal. So today, uh, and, and again, I, I, I am not saying we don't, we don't need to do this because obviously there's regulations that point us to do these things, to have defensible data done in a way that uh, OSHA, NIOSH, EPA, and many others have said, hey, this is how you do this uh, to make sure we're getting the right data to protect people. So this part and where we are now, what I'm going to talk about is cons somewhat conceptual but maybe exceeds what we have to do from a regulatory standpoint, and maybe you do both. Maybe you don't just keep doing the way we've done it, but the reality is there may be a way to make it so that we're giving someone protection 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and it's affordable. The reason people don't do it today is just like cell phones in the 90s. It wasn't affordable. Today, everyone has a cell phone. I don't know, I don't know anyone that doesn't have a cell phone, and it's just, the, again, the whole issue of, something becoming more mass produced. So for personal exposure monitoring today, we, you know, we place sampling equipment on personnel. They go to their work day or their work function. Um, you know, the samples go off to a lab or we have a real-time instrument and we download the data. We generate a report. We may enter that report into some automated, uh, you know, uh, 
IH program, uh, and then we provide the data to the data, you know, to that database, whatever it is, uh, and then we track it, and again, we take corrective action where we need to, or we just validate that we don't have an issue uh, and we keep moving forward. If we do have an issue, obviously, the big thing is getting some solution to try and eliminate the problem or at least eliminate exposure to the problem. So uh, that's, that's our trend today. That's how we do it today. And, you know, it's all, most of it's manual. We do a lot of what we do is manual. We, we, we write down things. We enter data. We do all these things, and we, we're always entering data, moving documents, doing things. Um, and there are some automated databases out there, but are we really util, are we utilizing those and are they effective? Uh, as opposed to potentially the future. So let's just take uh, uh, the idea that we take IH monitoring instead of hanging a badge or a, a meter on someone, that we actually use their proximity to the source uh, as our as how we do IH. So in most manufacturing sites, uh, you know, any refineries, uh, any kind of petrochemical, uh, any manufacturing plant, on and on and on. We we have these. We know where the problems are. We generally know where the problems are. And so uh, the key is, and we don't know when we don't know when a leak's going to occur. We don't know when uh, a bearing's going to be out of whack. All these things. So there are, you know, for things that are really safety related, like combustible uh, issues, we have real time monitors continuously out there monitoring that to make sure that we can take action if there's a, a life and death situation. But with the cost now of sensors coming down. And the ability to potentially know where someone is compared to a source, perhaps we do this the other way around. Now we put a quality device in, and we just have badges, very inexpensive badges with anchors uh, mounted accordingly to be able to tell when someone's close to a potential exposure issue. And I just, and, uh, if I've, I've used, I may have taken the liberty of using certain people's instruments in this. I hope, hope everybody's okay with that. but. Um, you know, a continuous noise monitor, whatever it may look like. Uh, you know, this one that I've chosen is obviously a very high-end device. It has a lot of functionality, frequencies, you know, not, uh, you know, all kinds of things that we can look at. And uh, we know where the noise source is. We know the proximity to it. We know what's going on around that area or just outside of that area. And before, we would hang a dosimer on someone. They would go into the area. We were measuring. We are taking care of it. Um, but now what if we just had tags on people and we continuously had a program using the power of the cloud and all this capability to say, hey, we've got some people in this area, uh, the noise level is X, and we now real time, without documenting, without writing down, without doing anything, we document this data. And we're even in discussions with some of the IH databases to put real time data in and we could build in this proximity capability so that it documents anyone's exposure to these noise sources. Uh, and from an IH standpoint, what's critical is whatever the source may be, whether it's uh, sound or it's uh, you know noise or it's uh, gases or vapors or, or heat or whatever it may be, um, we have to determine you know what is the distance in meters. And there's a lot of studies, for example, with noise that show you what the distribution would be away from that source. So if I know at the source I'm at 84 dB, for example, but I know as I move out four meters, I, I, I drop off, you know, by by some uh, calculatable uh, decibel level. Now I can start to go all the way out as far as I need to, based on someone's proximity to calculate their exposure. Not only can I calculate their exposure, I can do things well beyond just calculating exposure at any given moment. I can actually go to the cloud and I can alert someone to say, hey, you know, you've gone above the ceiling level. Hey, we need to take this action. Hey, uh, operations, I need you to go take a look at this pump right away because we're getting whatever. And, and it all starts to become very, very real time, automatically documented, automatically in the system. And, and it becomes a 24 hour, seven day a week way of doing what we do today uh, by taking samples and, and doing uh, things like that. And again, it will, it was, it, this is, this isn't going to change overnight. There's no way it's going to change overnight. We all understand the regulatory part of this. But from a pure application standpoint and moving forward, you can see how, uh, spending a little more on that end device, uh, spending $3,000 on, you know, on, uh, H2S fixed systems, uh, and having proximity badges opposed to having, you know, $20,000 worth of badges that have to be calibrated every year and they have a docking station and are they wearing their badge and, 
you know, were they really over there? I mean, it's just on and on. And, 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 and all I'm trying to do is stimulate your thought process because you're the people that innovate. You're the ones that are going to innovate. You're the ones that are going to change how we do what we do and, and, and drive things. And, and that's all this is, is that maybe this is the next normal. Maybe this is how we move forward uh, in some of these realms. And, and I, I think it's interesting. And the whole concept is to promote, pr provoke your thought process and, and go, wow, you know, I, we have an application that something like this might work or whatever, because that's how it all starts. It all starts just small and it eventually grows into something that uh, becomes very meaningful. Um, and it's, it's now today, it's all implementable. It's all available. Uh, I, I, I make it sound simple. The biggest issue we ever have with SmartSense is connectivity. And even that's improving just in the last month different firmware, different uh, SIM cards, different carriers have introduced new things to improve connectivity to the cloud. And it, it's not going to slow down because of the, the volume that's going to occur in that realm. So um, things keep getting better. And it, 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 if I make it sound simple, it's getting simpler and simpler. It, it's always going to get simpler. And hopefully everyone on this call, you know, uh, will engage it and let's make, make something better, faster, better to help people with data to make them safer. And uh, there's a lot more that can be extended off this and, uh, you know, knowing whether somebody's at, at a certain height, knowing whether or not someone has their mask, you know, their respirator on, knowing whether or not their respirator's, you know, in, in range of something that should be on and on. I mean, it just, it's, the, the ideas will grow and grow and grow, but at the beginning, I'm giving you this talk, hopefully to stimulate your thoughts and, uh, and maybe do something interesting with this. So what, what are we doing with this, the whole thing? Can you imagine 100% of our workers are covered for exposure every day, every minute of every day, of every second. We know our employees, our workers, our teammates are not being in an area or being exposed to something continuously 100% of the time. There's no sampling. There's no downloading. I hate to say it. There's no labs. Again, this isn't going to happen overnight. We all know that. And there's no data to transpose. There's nothing. It's all automatic. It's 100% protection, 24 days, seven days a week. Is it feasible? Is it something we would even think about? The technology is bringing us down this path as IHs, and, and I pose to you that uh, with some more innovative thought and some more ideas, it would be, uh, it'd be, fun, to, it'd be fun to try to, to maybe do some of this. And we're open for trials. SGS, we're open to do things, to trial things, work on things, figure things out. Uh, and uh, anyway, I hope we can all work together going forward, including all the, all the people that make these devices. I mean, it's all, we're all in this together, and uh, let's just make it better, if, it, if we can make it better. It's not bad now, but can we make it better? That's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening in, and I hope you found it interesting, and hopefully we'll get a lot of questions and, and uh, we'll move forward. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Brown. It looks like we have about 20 minutes for questions. Just a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the chat window on the right side of your screen and send to all panelists. Uh, Ron, our first question comes from Chris. Uh, it came in during the discussion of contact tracing technology, um, who asks, does the contact tracing alert to physical distancing? Does it, I'm sorry, does it alert what? Does the contact tracing alert to physical distancing? Right, that's exactly right. The contact tracing is um, is physical. Is it, the advanced one is actually able to tell where you are within three to four feet. The uh, lower cost system that will actually be the first one we release. It's more zone oriented, and uh, there is an advancement of that system that can that will notify you of your distance from another person that's wearing a badge as well. Uh, but the, otherwise, it's really more zone oriented. So when you walk into the room, if you will, the zone detector would go, hey, uh, badge 103 is in the room. Okay, here comes 108, 109, and they're just in the room, but they don't know where they are in the room. Uh, but again, that can be, you know, a, a 10 square foot area or a 40 square foot area. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, the next question I have, a, uh, it's a little bit longer, so um, let me... Um take this one. Uh, it says, hi, it's great to see that there is lots of innovation in the application of sensors in the IH field. With respect to gas sensors, are you aware of any research currently being done to improve the detection limits and accuracy of the sensors themselves? 
For example, some OHS regulations require the ability to detect chemical compounds at 10% of the TLV. To my knowledge, current sensors are not capable of detecting these low levels for chlorine, among other substances for which sensors are available. Let me yeah, repeat great. that one again. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. No, that's a great question. And that's exactly, you know, and again, so here comes a, here comes a, a stick for SCS Galson. One of the cool things about Galson is somebody calls and says, hey, I want to do this. We know to go, hey, what's your lower detection level? Well, how specific does it need to be? And we'll go, well, a real-time instrument doesn't do that. You can't do that with that. And, and so that's, a, that's, that's exactly what makes SCS Galson so unique in this whole uh, advent of technology is we realize what the requirements are based on the IH world to, to get down to the concentrations that are specific enough to do what you need them to do. And, again, just a little plug, that's why we came up with the sample capture device. We have a device that we can put with our smart sense unit that, for example, a chlorine sensor, you start to get a little bit of a bump. We know it might be noise, but in general, when you're looking at a baseline, it's not moving much. All of a sudden, you get a movement, bam, we start a pump, we take an air sample, pull it in, you sent the sample to the lab, and now we can validate it technically what the concentration was. And we do that with VOCs, like a PID doesn't know what it is, but we get 100 ppb of something. We pull a sample, to, you know, a grab sample, send it to us, we put it on a GC mass spec, we tell you what it was. So those kind of questions are exactly, I really appreciate that question because you have an understanding that it's not perfect. Now, the one thing I have to say is there are technologies that are moving forward to get better, but I think it's a faster movement to get smaller, less power, and cheaper. Uh, chlorine and some of those kind of compounds are more difficult. Um, and the last piece of that is some sensors have cross interferences, like an NO2 electrochemical sensor and an ozone sensor are cross interfering. So, but if you bring both of those into a cloud-based system, you can offset the ozone or the NO2 on the ozone sensor in the cloud. Like you can do that math, you can do that calculation. You can you can combine sensors that you know have different reactions and actually get to where you want to go by the combination of of outputs and sensor output. Okay, great. Thank Thanks. you. Um, our next question comes from Jerry, who asks. What are the legal considerations with using sensors to track employees while at work? For example, are there any limits to tracking movements and retaining the data? So uh, the first uh, system anyway that SGS is releasing, and there are a lot of contact tracing systems out there, uh, one of the big considerations was exactly that. And so SGS has a huge legal staff, obviously. And so the legal staff came back and said, if we don't identify the individual, we just use like a tag ID, and if we only do proximity in a room or in, a, in an area, just proximity in an area, then we can eliminate those issues. And there are companies now that are adopting that kind of technology um, everywhere, and it's just – it's more of uh, really just an alert when you have an exceedance in an area that you've uh, set the design that they, there can't be over X number of people in an area or there can't be X number of people in the kitchen area, for example – and you can get an alert and, and you know, notify everyone, hey, you need to, you need to not be congregating like this uh, as just a basic part of contact tracing. And one other thing, just very quickly, is that contact tracing solution, when they walk out of the facility, it no longer is connected to the network. But if they drive to another facility that has the same network, you can pick them up again in another building, go into another meeting. So it's really interesting that it can go across, again, using the cloud, you can, you can combine uh, that data of wherever those individuals go in, in your company. Okay, great, thanks. Um, this next question is from Paul. It came in a little earlier in your presentation. Um, he says, these are methods for getting information into a computer. The harder part is getting the data back out in the form of usable information. This requires a data analyst. Does SGS have an example of analyses that aggregate and summarize this data? Yeah, another great question. You know, everybody, this is uh, these are the kind of things that you know. You, if we don't have an answer, then we need to be working on it, right? And a really interesting question. So, so we have a database called LiveView that we're moving forward with that will allow us to, to combine all data. And we have a, we have a, even a bigger one coming in the future. But but these 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 databases are what we're working on because we see that as the glue, if you will. So. Um, the question is yes, and it's going to be automated as we go forward and provide that data instantaneously, just by a simple dashboard or by a simple what we call a query. Um, but the other really interesting thing about 
SPS is we have a group of folks in our company that are assigned to do nothing but the analytics. So we're in a position that if you give us something that you want it to look like, if you, if you came to me and say, with my SmartSense data, with my lab data, with whatever it is, I want a report that looks just like this, and I want these three fields open, and I want that there and this there, and I'm, you know, my letterhead, we'll generate that report for you using the data either off of SmartSense or even off our own lab data. And, and the key to that is trying to make it simpler for the tran so we get, start limiting transpose of data. We get rid of those sort of things, and we feed the data right into something that can generate those reports. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Brian, who asks, is SGS doing anything to confirm IH chemical exposure models are accurate using personal exposure data and proximity badges? So to date, this has not been done. Um, uh, this is this would be a great a great study, and um, but we, we're not there uh, at that point yet uh, to be able to compare that kind of data. Now we have done some projects, and I'm, I'm glad to share. I can't share the client name, obviously, but we have done a project where we actually had passive badges. This was all for NO2. We had a passive NO2 badge. We had our shark product, which had an NO2 badge without the uh, passive membrane, and we had a SmartSense device, and we have all the uh, local air quality stations NO2 data. And we're able to take all that data and compare it simultaneously. Now, obviously, the badge was it was out there for a period of time, so it's really just the average concentration, and we use that to look at the basic average of the entire output of the sensors and align those. And it's we, we're in the process of getting into that type of study, uh, the beginning of it, using that that particular data set. We also have um, thermal absorption tubes in a project that also have SmartSense uh, and Sharks again, and again those that type of comparative data we're going to do as we go and build those studies up. Um, and be able to share those with people. Okay, great. Uh, the next question comes from Dave, who asks, what do you see as SPS's role with this new technology? Uh, so SPS is, is, uh, is keen, uh, even within our own corporately. This is from our CEO of SPS globally. Uh, and we have a, we have a targeted uh, number that the innovation teams at SGS have to hit for new technology. Um, and so SGS, or one of the really interesting things about SGS is it's almost like a bunch of little entrepreneurial areas. So for example, and I'm throwing this out to everyone because you're on this call and somebody, if you called me tomorrow or today after this call and you go, hey Ron, we have this and we blah, blah, we're gonna do this and we're thinking about that. And we, we were to evaluate that. SGS is the kind of group where if I went back to and I go, hey, here's some business opportunity. Here's a study we could do. Here's something somebody had an idea on from our IH partner world. Um, give me, give me fifty thousand dollars. And if they believe in it, they'll they'll write the check. And that's a very unique thing. Again, being the size company we are and the power of SES, once something hits and 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 is interest you know, of interest, and they see that it's a potential uh, drive toward the future, they'll fund it. They will fund these things, and that's. That's something I used to be the little guy, you know, the little company, and I, I, I fought just to, you know, make payroll to the people. And, and it's really neat to have a company that's yes, and every day they wake up, all they want to do is make things better. That's it. That's their goal. So to spend money on something that's going to make everything work better and us be a part of that technology, SGS is all over it. They're all over it. And it's really cool. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, next question comes from Ahmed. Uh, that was toward the end of your presentation, um, who asked, what is the control for data security? Yeah, so every, all of these things are all on secure websites. It's uh, you know it's basically using uh, Amazon servers and and uh, other web locations or server locations that are very secure. And then all the websites are are encrypted. Um, so some of the clients that we work with, we've actually had to go through their through their uh, testing uh, where they try to break in, in, into the systems and. Uh, and get the data, and uh, we've gone through those challenges, data challenges, and and so it's it, you know all these things are working now. I mean, it's uh, it's all very very um, very secure, and we're glad to go through any of those challenges. Okay, great. Next question comes from Jessica, who asks: For the badges and contact tracing, are there considerations for if the wearer removed the badge or lost the badge, such as it fell off during work? 
Yeah, so again, it's uh, it, the configuration of that is uh, there's an admin area that you can go in and just change the badge number and reassign it. Um, it's really simple. It takes minutes. It's nothing complicated at all. Okay, uh, next question comes from Michael, who says, great presentation. Uh, do you feel that both accuracy and precision of the real-time monitors applied to integrated slash continuous monitoring is already equal to or better than field sampling methods and lab and lab analyses? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, so, you know, a lot of people don't understand what the, even the accuracy is sometimes on, on laboratory data. Um, but it, it, if you have the right sensor and it's specific enough and it has the right detection levels, uh, my opinion is it, it's as good. The, the problem is, and, and again, even AIHA has formed committees for all these things, you know, big data uh, sensor committees. Um, you know, at some point, it's going to get approved by OSHA or whoever to go, hey, this is an effective measurement, like carbon monoxide. I mean, we don't, for carbon monoxide, everybody uses a real-time meter now because we know that they're reliable and they're specific enough to do its job most of the time. And uh, so I think, I think as a rule, in my opinion, I think uh, there are some that can do it. The cool thing is, again, as a lab, what we love, Hey, I want to validate this thing. Hey, we're going to send you a pump in a, the right tube, or we're going to send you a, a you know a particle uh, a pump in a, a you know a, a pad you know a, a cassette. We're going to send you whatever, and you send it back to us, and we can pull up the data, and we can all look at it and go, hey, that's right on. That's uh, you know against the known method, this thing is reading accurately. So that, that challenge is always a really cool thing that we can provide. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is, are these devices intrinsically safe in flammable environments? So uh, today, well, our devices are not, but there are, uh, I'm sure Industrial Scientific and some of these other folks are, uh, they always go down the path of intrinsic safety because it's a big part of their business. So there are a lot of devices out there that are intrinsically safe that will begin to become these web-enabled devices. Um, in our case, what we've done, uh, we've done some intrinsic safe applications using uh, purge methods. Uh, and so it's, uh, and, and there's some really interesting sensors. We can tie any sensor made by any manufacturer that has an analog output, we can tie that to our platform. So uh, that's how we've done it in the past. And we are, uh, and we'll partner with anybody that makes those kind of devices, right? But for sure, uh, that those are available out there and you'll see more. I'm sure Industrial Scientific will be presenting that probably in the next uh, presentation. Okay, thanks. The next question is from Jill, who asks, how are the sensors calibrated slash checked? So, really cool question, Jill. <laughs> so, obviously, we're of the mindset to be as technically accurate as possible. So, uh, we have a method with our platform that you can uh, you can put on a cow hood and check it. Um, but within the next quarter, we will release a system that will have uh, certified test gas that actually will automatically calibrate your instrument. So you will have calibration done remotely. Uh, again, depending on the compounds and what you're looking at, uh, that the calibration can be done without anybody going out there. It'll, it'll actually have the certified calibration gas, uh, these new miniature little bottles, and uh, a regulator, and our system will allow the uh, basically to turn that cal gas on, and then through the web, you go into our calibration portal, and you can calibrate the instrument. Okay, great. Uh, next question comes from Dave, who asks, what kinds of sensors are available and are there limitations versus traditional sensors? So in, in our case, again, it's uh, because we can tie to any analog channel, we can bring any sensor on. Our, our inherent sensors are, if you look at Industrial Scientific, uh, you know, Honeywell, any of those, all the electrochemicals, PIDs, any of those sensors are fit into our sockets on our platform today, and we could put as many of those together as you want. Uh, in a single uh, in a single platform, a single device. Um, but since we've added the ability to bring in the analog signal, we now are tying to people like RKI, uh, you know, all kinds of monitors, anything you can imagine. Uh, we can tie it into the system and bring it into the platform so that you can uh, get that data on a on a, a you know on a portal, a friendly uh, visual portal, and the data readily available to you at your fingertips. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Christopher, who asks, do you think that forcing employees to participate in contact tracing is morally or ethically wrong or an invasion of privacy? 
Yeah, so I'm the I'm the wrong guy for that question. I, I uh, you know, there's corporate policies and things that I think you know SGS obviously has corporate policies, and uh, we actually installed some contact tracing within SGS's facilities. So for SGS, we've we've taken the step because we think it's responsible for us as a company, and our employees uh, don't mind it because it's not specific to them. It's not tracking them in areas that you're not worried about congregation. Um, and so, you know, at this point, uh, SDS is behind it, but I'm sure other companies have different opinions. Um, and that, I, I think that is a company sp- specific issue. I, I, don't, I think it's a good idea on my, if you're as an individual, because if someone can notify me immediately that, hey, you were in this room, you were there for 30 minutes and, and, uh, bad serial five was in there, uh, and we have an issue, I, I think that's invaluable, uh, to try and to control the disease, in my opinion. Great, thanks, Ron. Uh, next question, uh, we'll see um, here it says, um, how do you account for HIPAA for contact tracing? Pre-existing conditions are a medical issue. How do you protect employees while keeping this in mind? Yeah, same, same. I think it's a related question to the previous one. Uh, you know, all those things come into play. Um, and I think, you know, it's just, again, it's gonna come down to your company and, and how they, they do all these things. And uh, I, I I think it really, it's up to the individual companies. Sure, sounds good. Uh, next question comes from Eugene, who asks, how does the data collected get treated? Is it as an exposure record? If it is construed as an exposure record, how do you envision retaining the big data to meet OSHA record keeping requirements for exposure data? So again, the, the power of the cloud and that ability to hand off data to other uh, cloud computing uh, devices, um, is why we're talking to uh, IH um, platforms that do this, and safety platforms that uh, are already collecting this data. It's just not automatic from real-time devices and from uh, location of personnel. So, uh, you know, again, we're not going to reinvent the wheel. Some of these types of databases are readily available, and by uh, using software that allows us to uh, basically transfer that data to somebody else in a meaningful way and then to be able to import it or automatically bring it into their system, uh, that's how we're looking at doing this, and we've had those conversations with a couple of them. Uh, I'm not going to mention their names, but uh, there is one group out there that's very aggressive about this. Uh, actually, two of them, uh, but one is kind of leading the uh, the charge, and, and we are integrated, are trying to integrate with them uh, as we speak. Okay, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, I know we had a lot of questions today, um, so I just wanted to let everyone know that we'll be passing all these questions on to SGS Galson um, so that um, if your question wasn't answered today, um, they should be able to get in touch with you to answer that. Um, so Ron, I think this will be our last question for today. Um, it comes from John who asks, how will contact tracing be able to recognize respirator use? So with the uh, capability of, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna call the technology what we've identified so far, low energy Bluetooth, uh, has the ability in that device to be able to recognize things close to it or away from it. Um, and depending on the anchors and positioning the anchors, you can actually determine height. So if you can imagine on a respirator having a, another very, very small tag, battery tag, uh, that would then pair up with the individual. And you've seen some of this with other air monitors. Um, you can, you can determine whether or not it's on there. Now keep in mind, if you, you know, you start messing with masks, if you penetrate anything or do anything, you might have an issue. But the reality is, if you work with the manufacturer, we work with the manufacturer, you could actually determine whether or not somebody was actively respirating into that respirator, right? So, the, again, it all goes to sensors, go to the cloud, local awareness, and, and, and knowing where things are in comparison to other, you know, other people's, um, their, their own badges or their own uh, tracking asset badges. So, it's, uh, all that's very, very doable. And some of it's being done today. It's just, it's just not there yet. So. But we can bring it there okay, together. Right. Hey, one one plug, everyone. Just be sure uh, and watch out coming our aerosol tracing capability with a partner that we're going to be bringing in. And this is one of the most dynamic things to help track aerosols. It's a DNA tracing system. And I think everyone's going to be extremely interested in this. So please be looking for any of our emails or announcements uh, regarding the ability to track aerosols so you can determine uh, efficiency of things that are being used for the purpose of uh, controlling COVID and also just where airflow is going in your building with regard to aerosol and emissions uh, from a potential carrier. So please be on the lookout for that. It is absolutely incredible. 
Okay, thanks. Uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. My thanks to Ron for his presentation, to SGS Galson for sponsoring today's Synergist webinar, and to all of our participants. Registration is already open for two Synergist webinar events happening in November. On November 12th, Industrial Scientific will sponsor a presentation on gas sensors, the Internet of Things, and big data. And on November 17th, please join us for a live presentation of OHD's QuantiFit respirator fit test instrument and QuantiCheck quantitative user seal check device. Thank you all again, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, AI. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. This was great. Thanks this actually concludes today's webcast. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for attending. The recording will be available at aiha.webvent.tv. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with this link, and please visit our event calendar to sign up for future webcasts.